Uh, so this is a uh, joint work with my supervisor, Kevin Leighton Brown, uh, with Paul, and uh, as well with Ilya Segal. What is Auctionomics? <laughs> Auctionomics is a uh, company uh, which you can talk to Paul about. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, this talk is going to be about a spectrum auction, but sometimes if you say the word spectrum too many times, people's eyes glaze over. So I want to start talking about something a bit more tangible and then bring it back. Um, so here's a, a maybe a contrived, ridiculous example um, that I'll bring back to the incentive auction in a second. Imagine that you have an airline, and on one of your particular flights, a group of firefighters going to fight an emergency want a lot of extra seats on your plane. But the problem is that you've already sold all of your seats to real passengers. So you want to help, but on the one hand, you can't, unless maybe you can pay off some passengers to not board the plane. Uh, the firefighters will then pay you more than you're paying the passengers, and you'll profit and be able to help in this way. And so the goal here is ideally to sell as many seats as possible without losing money. And one algorithm that you could use to do this is to decide you're going to sell 90% of your available seats you can then figure out how much it's going to cost you to pay off passengers, assuming you only have 10% of your seats available. And I'm gonna talk about exactly how you might do that in the next couple slides. Mm -hmm. Then you can ask the firefighters how much they're willing to pay for these 90% of your seats. If they're going to pay you more than you're paying off the passengers, then great, you can stop the algorithm. Otherwise, you can try selling fewer seats, like 80% of your seats and then 70% of your seats. Now, passengers are a bit tricky to sell to. They all travel in groups, and every group has some sort of a private value for their seats. And each group is either going to board the plane or sell their seats as a unit. And so what I'm showing here are three different groups, A, B, and C. On the right, I'm using that bar to show that group A has a higher value for its seats than group B, than does group C. And A, B, and C, well, at least A, B, a and B are the same size, and they're different sizes than C. And in that leftover seating space, I wouldn't be able to accommodate A, B, and C altogether. So the way that you're going to allocate these seats is with a descending clock auction. And this is an obviously strategy-proof auction that you can use to do this. And the way that this is going to work is that you're initially going to offer every group a really high price to not board the plane. And you hope that many of the groups will say yes, they'll take this really high price and not board the plane. Uh, but some of them might say no, and that's fine. Those groups that reject your offer will board the plane. And the rule in this auction is once you board that plane, you're never getting off. It's possible that we can ask you to move seats in the plane to accommodate other groups, but you can never leave. After this, you now have some groups that are still not on the plane, and you want to lower their prices. And the way that you're going to do this is you're going to go one by one to each group. You're going to see if it can still fit on the plane alongside all of the passengers that are already on the plane. If it can, then you can lower its price. You make it a new offer. If it accepts that new offer, then great, you've lowered its price. If it rejects that new offer, then it boards the plane and it leaves the auction. If you cannot fit it on the plane, right, as prices keep lowering and groups decide to board the plane, the plane is going to fill up. So at some point, you're going to find a group that you cannot fit on the plane anymore. These groups, you're not allowed to lower their price. We're going to call them frozen. The auction is going to end in a state when every group is either frozen or on the plane. And you'll pay the groups that are frozen the prices that they froze at. And now, obviously, this talk is not about airplanes. It's about the FCC's incentive auction. So the Federal Communications Commission in the United States ran an auction in 2016, 2017. It ran over 13 months. And the goal of this auction was to repurpose radio spectrum from broadcast television to wireless internet. And the reason you might want to run this auction is that fewer people these days are watching their television through the radio waves, like via an antenna. Whereas that spectrum is really valuable to mobile companies to provide, say, data plans. And the picture you want to have in your head is, as I'm showing here, that maybe there are a large set of channels beforehand, and then after the auction, some of these TV channels are going to get cut away and become wireless internet. In the actual incentive auction, 14 such channels were removed from the airwaves and sold for $20 billion. $10 billion was paid to stations to relinquish their broadcasting rights. So as you might imagine, when you remove some television channels from the airwaves, not every television station will be able to continue to broadcast in the reduced set of channels due to electromagnetic interference constraints based on where they're physically located. And the way that this auction works is exactly like this contrived airplane example that I've talked about earlier. 
the FCC is going to start out by selecting some large number of channels to sell, much like you selected the large number of seats that you were going to sell. You then run a reverse auction for the TV stations, and this is going to determine which television stations you're going to buy and what prices you're going to need to pay them. And this is exactly like the auction that you ran with the passengers. There's then going to be a forward auction for the telecom firms. You're going to figure out how much they're going to pay for this number of channels. And then, if that forward auction can cover the cost of the reverse auction, the auction stops. And if it can't, then you go back to the forward auction, to the reverse auction, sorry, selling a fewer channels. So in this talk, I'm going to be revisiting the incentive auction design. I'm going to mostly focus on the reverse auction, and I'm going to do this via simulations. And you might ask why. Um, I was talking to uh, Kira last night about this talk, and she said basically, you know, you're still talking about the incentive auction. And the reason that we're talking about an auction that's happened maybe two years ago is that this was a novel, extremely complex auction that was produced under a lot of time pressure. And it's important to understand what elements were most important and were there variations of the design that might have led to even better outcomes. So we've done many experiments in this vein, and this talk is just going to highlight a few of our examples. So what I mean by simulations, it, like our methodology for these experiments, is that first, we built a reverse auction simulator. And this mostly follows the rules of the reverse auction, uh, but there are a few abstractions. And then in order to run simulations in this way, you need some sort of a bidder model, right? And this is going to describe how the bidders respond to the offers that they're getting. In our case, because it's an obviously strategy proof auction, we can assume that stations are going to just myopically maximize their utility. And that means that basically this bidder model for us looks more like a value model. And in the literature, fortunately, there is a value model for stations participating in this particular auction that we're able to leverage. Given the bidder model and our auction simulator, if we run a value profile through our simulator, we'll get some auction outcome. But of course, you don't just want one outcome, you want several. So this bidder model has to be something that you can sample from. Once we have many outcomes, we can then make a change to our auction simulator. We can have auction simulator B, where we've changed some rule about the incentive auction. Now we can run the same value profiles through the simulator and the change simulator and compare the two outcomes. And the way that we're going to score our both outcomes is with two metrics. One is the value loss. This is the sum of the station's values that we remove from the airwaves. Equivalently, you can think of maximizing the station values that stay on the airwaves. And the cost of acquiring spectrum. So this is how much you're paying to the stations that win. And you want to minimize both of these metrics. So for the rest of this talk, and, and up until now, I've been talking about um, whether stations can fit alongside other stations that have exited the auction as if they're knapsack problems. As Paul mentioned in his talk yesterday, uh, it's actually much more similar to a graph coloring problem uh, involving this crazy interference graph over here. Uh, this graph is really hard to reason about, which is why simulations have been a tool used by the FCC and uh, the broader research community. And these checks happen every round of the auction, every time you want to lower a station's price, making the simulations very expensive. So, the first experiment that I want to talk about is that the FCC used um, market forces to determine what the right number of channels was to sell. So it wanted to sell as many channels as possible. It didn't know the right number up in advance to post for sale. And so there's this alternating scheme between the reverse and forward auctions. But one thing that you might worry about is that there are commitments that carry between each stage of the auction. Specifically, you can never raise a station's price, and once a station leaves the auction, it's gone for good. And so we were worried, you know, is there some sort of a penalty for having this um, endogenous parameter of how many channels to sell? So I'm going to make this intuition uh, concrete with an example. So let's assume that there are three stations in the auction, A, B, and C. And on the right, I'm now showing bars to indicate where their current prices are. And in the um, whether they can fit into this blue spectrum versus that uh, gray spectrum, which is the spectrum that we're going to sell to the um, mobile carriers. So that's spectrum that we can't use, and the blue, the blue is spectrum that we can use. So if you run this auction, initially, all three stations can fit in that blue spectrum, so we can lower all of their prices. At some point, A's price is going to fall below its value, and it will exit the auction into that blue space. <coughs> 
Now, the next time we go to lower B's price, we'll realize that there's nowhere to put it inside that blue region. That means that B's price is now uh, frozen. Um, C can still fit, though. So C will eventually exit the auction at some point. And this is going to be our final outcome. We're going to buy B at this price over here on the side. Now, imagine that the forward auction runs next, and we find out that mobile carriers don't want to pay this much. So B wants a certain amount of money, and the mobile carriers do not want that much money. So the mobile carriers are not covering the cost of the auction. That means that we go to the next stage of the auction. And that means that we're going to sell the mobile carriers fewer channels and make more channels available for the TV stations. Let's pretend that means that you add this new area to the blue spectrum. Well, the problem is we can't actually use any of this new spectrum because when we go to station B, we still can't lower its price. And we've already promised to pack A and C, so there's no way that we can do anything about that. And unfortunately, even though we have more space to work with, we can't really change the outcome. But what if we'd known in advance that the mobile carriers weren't going to pay that much money? Well, then we would have started with the right amount of spectrum. B would have exited the auction because it would not have frozen. And C would have frozen at a lower price than B froze in the previous example. So this is an outcome that scores better according to both of our metrics. So that was just intuition. Now I want to talk about how this plays out in our simulations. So what I'm showing you on this graph are every point is a simulation. Um, and I'm scoring each simulation according to our two metrics, value loss on the x-axis and cost on the y-axis. And I ran 50 value profiles through um, simulations that ran through four stages, which is what happened in the actual incentive auction. The FCC first tried to sell 21 channels, then 19, then 18, and eventually 14. And using the same value profiles, we ran simulations that just started trying to sell 14 channels and had the auction end immediately after that. And these points are normalized by the, auction, by the auctions that only ran through a single stage. So what you can see um, is that the auctions that ran through four stages experienced significantly higher value losses and costs. That is, they scored worse on both of our metrics. And so I think this intuition bears out in our simulations. So if there is such a cost to this multi-stage approach, is there anything that we can do to maybe lessen the penalty? And one new idea that's come out since the auction and thinking about it is what if you ran the forward auction before the reverse auction? Then during the reverse auction, you could just stop the reverse auction at any point that you realize that you weren't going to that you were going to sell the spectrum for too much for more money than the telecom companies were willing to pay. Then you could just go back to the forward auction selling fewer channels. And I'll make this clear by revisiting our example. So at this point in time, you realized that you were going to have to pay B that amount of money as soon as it froze. If you knew in advance that the telecom companies were not going to pay that much money, you could stop the auction right there, go back, have another forward auction for the larger set of spectrum, and then you would return to this clear amount of spectrum. You'd be able to let B exit the auction, and you would get the good outcome, where you're buying a less expensive station for a cheaper price. So again, this is just intuition, but we can see whether it bears out in the simulations. What I'm plotting here are early stopping auctions. So we ran 50 value profiles of auctions that use this early stopping technique against what I'm calling a single stage oracle. These are auctions that, looking at where these early stage au stopping auctions ended, ran a single stage auction selling the same number of channels. And what we can see from this graph is that you wind up recovering most of that penalty that you saw in the previous slide. So these early stopping auctions are doing almost as good as if you'd known the right amount of spectrum to clear right from the beginning. I'm not going to show the experiments here in this talk, but what we also found was that these early stopping auctions actually wound up clearing more spectrum than the non-early stopping counterparts, which was one of the stated goals of the auction. In the actual incentive auction, the reverse auction in the very first stage when the FCC tried to sell 21 channels, required $86.4 billion to be paid to the television stations. And afterwards, when they asked the mobile carriers how much they would pay for it, they said only at about $23 billion. If we'd known that the mobile carriers were only going to be able to pay $23 billion for the spectrum, then we could have stopped the reverse auction's first stage during its first day of the actual auction happening. 
This stage lasted about a month, so we might have saved a month off this 13-month auction. As well, 475 stations exited throughout the rest of that first stage. And these might have happened later uh, anyways, but these were commitments that were perhaps prematurely made. Now, one question that you might have is how robust are our results to the value model that we used, right? I said we used some value model from the literature. What if we changed the value model? Would we find similar things, or are our results completely dependent on that? And so to answer this question, we've recently designed a second value model that's based on the released bid data. So after the auction, I think two years after the auction, the bid data became public. Our new model works as follows. We assume that a station's value is equal to the population that it can broadcast to, which is known to be an important factor in station values, times something else. And that something else I'm going to call noise. Let's assume that it comes from some distribution, and I'm going to bundle everything else about station values into that noise. Well, if we knew the distribution that noise came from, we'd be done. We could assume something about it, um, but instead we're going to try and do something empirically. So let's assume that noise has a cumulative distribution function called n. What we can do from the bids is extract upper and lower bounds on station values. And the way that this works is you assume that if I ask a station, uh, will you accept $100 to give me your license, and it says yes, and then you ask it, will you accept $95 to give me your license, and it says no, you have some concrete idea uh, that its license is worth something between $95 and $100 to it. Using these samples and assuming that stations are following our value model, we can transform these samples into upper and lower bounds on the noise distribution. Now, recalling that um, with a cumulative distribution function, if we take uh, n of an upper bound of a sample minus n of the lower bound of a sample, what we're really getting is the probability that the sample falls between its upper and lower bound. So we can write down a maximum likelihood expression that is going to find the CDF that maximizes the probability of our observed data. And this is just going to be subject to the cumulative distribution function constraints that n has to have values between 0 and 1, and that it has to be monotone increase, non-decreasing. And we're actually able to convert this into a convex program and solve it. And what the solution gives us is a value for n at each of these upper and lower bounds. And when we do this, what we found is that it looks surprisingly linear on a log scale. And so this becomes our value model, or this becomes our model of n. So we're going to sample something from the CDF and multiply it by a station's population, and that's going to be our value model. Using this new value model, we again find that running the same experiment of single-stage auctions versus multi-stage auctions, the single-stage auctions are, do better on both metrics. The actual magnitudes are a bit smaller here, but still seeing something like a 15% uh, difference in both of these metrics which you know, on the scale of billions of dollars is very significant no matter what value model you're listening to. So what I hope you'll take away from this talk in conclusion is that computationally intensive simulations are one way that you might be able to explore markets that have uh, crazy constraints like that interference graph. Maybe some specific insights about the incentive auction design that running through multiple stages uh, could have been harmful, and we see this according to both of our value models, and that this early stopping amendment might have been able to fix that. And with luck, maybe some of these insights can generalize to other markets that you care about. Thanks.